Hello. Uh, this is the 7th of April, Tuesday, 2020. Day God knows what in this uh, stay-at-home quarantine. And the day before Passover begins, P Pesach, my favorite holiday. May we indeed find liberty in our lives in the healthiest sense. Anyway, Tony Sportiello, the uh, one-time fearless leader of the Workshop Theater, uh, and now in, in, uh, who's creating this Algonquin variety show on this network, asked me graciously to supply a Shakespeare sandwich of three different monologues, as it were, of roles that he's uh, seen me do over the many years we've known each other, more than two decades that he and I have known each other and been friends and collaborators. And so uh, we chose collectively uh, Jaquist from As You Like It, and then uh, Shylock from The Merchant of Venice, and Bottom from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Those are certainly three disparate characters and, and shows an expanse of the variety of Shakespeare's writings. So with uh, Jaquist, and as you like it, and this is a very orum that was given to me uh, by Letty Ferrer, and I think this belonged to her father, Jose Ferrer, great honor to have. And in act two of scene seven of As You Like It, in the uh, merry forest of Arden, the good duke, uh, is there with his philosopher counselor, the rather melancholy Jaquis. And uh, Orlando, the, uh, the masculine hero of the play, of course, it's really Rosalind's play, but, but Orlando, you know, has some good stuff to do. He's a very virtuous character. And he's trying to uh, feed his elderly friend Adam. And they're starving, they're just starving. And he comes in and, you know, he threatens the Duke and Jaquist for the food they're about to eat. And they went, you know, you don't have to threaten us, you know, we'll share it with you. And Orlando says, okay, just don't, let me go get my friend. And obviously, in not Shakespeare's words, he says these things. And, and he'll partake of their generous offer of food. And he runs off and the Duke says to Jacobus, thou seest we are not all alone, unhappy. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play on. And Jacobus, without missing a beat, comes right in and says, all the world's a stage. And all the men and women, merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with the woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow, that a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good capon line, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards Childish treble, 
pipes and whistles in the sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. And that's Jaquis. Now with uh, Shylock and the Merchant of Venice. It's very important to note that in the first scene, Act 1, Scene 3, he's being asked by Bassanio to lend 3,000 ducats and uh, it'll be co-signed by Antonio, the Merchant of Venice, his friend. And Antonio has been rather rude to Shylock in the past in the Rialto spat on his Jewish gabardine and Tim's face and does all kinds of nasty things to him simply because him being a Jew, which was prevalent at the time, of course. And uh, not exactly all that strange at certain places at this time. In any case, uh, they strike a bargain, and, and Shylock basically just wants to, you know, be able to not have to take his Jewish gabardine to the Venetian dry cleaners all the time. So, you know, he'll lend the 3,000 ducats for a pound of flesh, you know, something that's highly improbable in a merry sport. Well, between Act 1 and Scene 3 and Act 3, Scene 1, a lot transpires. Basically, the only person in the world that Shylock really loves, his daughter, Jessica, whom he's raised, his mother having passed away, Leah. So as a widower, he's raised Jessica for an indeterminate time. He was probably the only parent that Jessica really knew. And she runs off with the Gentile, Lorenzo. And Shylock, learning both that Antonio's three ships have probably foundered, so his ships literally will not come in with the fortune to be pay back the 3,000 ducats. But more importantly to him, uh, they conspired to make Jessica his daughter by running off with the Gentile dead to him. That's how he interprets it. And so when he's confronted by Salarino and Solano in Act 3, Scene 1, and uh, they mock him, for, you know, he's heard that Jessica's run off with Lorenzo. And uh, these were my grandfather's glasses. So they're genuine antiques. My grandfather, Samuel, from Russia. And with Salarino asks uh, Shylock, uh, but tell us, do you hear whether Antonio have had any loss at sea or no? And Shylock responds, there I have another bad match, a bankrupt, a prodigal, who dare scarce show his head on the Rialto, a beggar that was used to come so smug upon the mud. Let him look to his bond. He was wont to call me usurer. Let him look to his bond. He was wont to lend money for a Christian courtesy. Let him look to his bond. And Salarino says, uh, I am sure if you forfeit, you will not take his flesh. What's that good for? to bait fish withal. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heeded mine enemies. And what's his reason? I am a Jew.
has not a Jew eyes, has not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is, If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. Yeah. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? What? Revenge. The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. And that's Shylock. I'll use this for Passover tomorrow, though. And then we come to maybe my favorite of all, Nick Bottom from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Nick Bottom, the ham actor, the, who would be a great tragedian. And uh, when Puck puts an ass's head on him in rehearsal, the marvelous comedian place with Petey Quince in the rehearsal and the other mechanicals. It's merely a redundancy of his character. And so as an ass, he has this love affair with the queen of the fairies, Titania, but then Oberon takes pity on them all and has Puck remove the ass's head and puts all the characters to sleep so that they awaken and believe it to have been a dream, an act four. When my cue comes, call me and I will answer. My, no my next is most fair pyramus. <clears throat> Hey ho! Peter Quince! Flute the bellows mender! Snout the tinker! Starling! God, my life stolen hence and left me asleep. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream. Past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Me thought I was, there was no man can tell what. Me thought I wasn't, me, me, me thought I had, but man is but a patch fool if he offered to say what we thought I had. The eye of man hath not heard. The ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. 
I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream because it hath no bottom. <laughs> and I was singing the latter end of the play before the Duke. Peradventure, to make it the more gracious. I shall sing it at her death. <coughs> and that's bottom. Well, I hope you enjoyed this Shakespeare sandwich. Tony, edit this any way you want. Farewell. <laughs>